Uh, we're changing now from revolutionary science to revolutionary technology. And in fact, our world is changing behind our backs. The digital revolution is really changing everything and first of all, our view of the world. But let's go back a little bit. So, in the past, humans believed that life is a mystery you can't understand. And that humans are a specially created species unlike all others. But we also believe that the Earth is flat, that the Earth is in the center of the universe, and many other things that obviously are wrong. So, scientific instruments for discovery have changed our world view, and they allowed us to explore the universe and our Earth and to understand them much better. I've been raised at a time when most people believed that traffic jams are unavoidable, that crowd disasters are God-given or caused by panic, by aggressive behavior, that stock markets crash because of black swans, or that only lazy people are unemployed, that cultural progress is due to wars and that revolutions are caused by Twitter, that social order can be only created by top-down control, and that humans are the crown of creation. This is all wrong. And the digital revolution is now producing entirely new insights, and even an entirely new world. Again, let's go back and look into an example that you're well familiar with. Quite some time ago, Röntgen invented the X-ray, and that helped us to reveal a lot of things that are wrong, and obviously, you know, that helped us to fix these things. Uh, actually, it helped millions of people. Even though it's an old invention, it's still in use, and it's very helpful still. Why is this? Because it made things visible that could otherwise not be seen. Now the question is, are we getting into an age where we can now reveal the reasons for success or failure in our society? For example, can we prevent crime before it happens? And in fact, you may have read about the pre-crime uh, pre programs that are actually in use. And then, if we can do this, can we perhaps prevent diseases before they break out? And of course, you're aware that now many people are using Fitbit and are measuring their health data and are trying to find out about their situation. And in fact, um, we might get into this situation where we don't need to go to a doctor anymore. And if we fall ill still, we might use a tele-doctor approach. And besides this, there will be personalized medicine. So the idea is that every person is different. In the past, basically, medicine had a different kind of impact. You know, some people uh, were sensitive to medication and it worked well. Others suffered from side effects or it didn't work. So in the future, we'll know much better about the interaction between medicine and people and social environments and genes and all this. And this will help us to have a specific medication. And some of the drugs that have been approved in the past because they haven't been effective for an average population might be useful to heal specific people in the future. So this is going to create new markets. And ATI Zurich has just set up a focus area on personalized medicine. But obviously, all this requires a hell of a lot of data. So, where to get these data? Well, now everyone, of course, is talking about big data. And in just one minute, we are sending out 700,000 queries to Google we are posting 500,000 Facebook posts. And besides this, we are moving the 
these movements are recorded by our smartphones uh, with GPS sensors. We are shopping on the web. All of this is recorded too. And so basically all our human activities now, be it in the economic system or our social activities, are somehow being recorded. They're reflected by digital breadcrumbs. And so can we soon know everything? Well, certainly one would have to get all these data and uh, one would have to find a reason to collect all these data. And um, of course, you know, since Snowden, this is happening and uh, politicians have found some reason uh, to allow this collection of data to happen. And so the question, what can we do with this? Yeah, just imagine you had all these data. Could we create a crystal ball? A crystal ball that tells us what's happening in the world, in any place of the world, at any time, right now. That could even maybe predict the future. And with all these data, could we decide and act like a wise king? Just imagine, you know, you had all these data. So if information technology would make it possible, who of you would like to rule like a wise king? Please raise your arms. Come on, no, nobody out there. <laughs> well, that's interesting. So you would certainly need a lot of power to do this. Could knowledge empower you? Could you have something like a magic wand? And if yes, how would it work? Well, you would certainly have to manipulate people's choices by personalized information. And in fact, you know, if you search for information on the web, you get personalized results now. And so, this is already happening. The question then is, are we already remotely controlled? Maybe you won't do it, but is the Silicon Valley doing it? And that's a question that we need to seriously ask. Now, independently of how powerful you would be with all the data that you might be in control of. Due to the rise of intelligent machines, the digital revolution may finally beat its revolutionaries too. The course, the digital revolution, it's on its way. And actually, within about 10 years time, we'll have a situation where computers are as smart as humans. Some people say 25, but that's shocking enough. So, what are the implications of this? I was really shocked when I saw this graph, uh, say, 10 years ago. But now we have robots and they become more and more capable and sophisticated. Not only this, uh, this one is playing table tennis, obviously. Robots can now learn. They soon can multiply. Yeah, that means they can build other robots, and moreover, they cannot only build the same kind of robots, they will be able to build better robots. That means they will be able to evolve without our help. Since many years, intelligent machines are already better than chess players, and they're also better workers, as we can see over here. Uh, this should be... Situations. But they're the old kind of automation. This is the new kind. Meet Baxter. Unlike these things which require skilled operators and technicians and millions of dollars, Baxter has vision and can learn what you want him to do by watching you do it. And he costs less than the average annual salary of a human worker. Unlike his older brothers, he isn't pre-programmed for one specific job. He can do whatever work is within the reach of his arms. Baxter is what might be thought of as a general purpose robot, and general purpose is a big deal. Think computers. They too started out as highly custom and highly expensive, but when cheap-ish general purpose computers appeared, they quickly became vital to everything. 
Okay, so basically, but they haven't taken over the world because they're all. So they haven't taken over the world yet, but they're getting smarter and smarter. And in particular, they're not just better workers in many areas. They're also soon better drivers. We're talking about Google self-driving cars. And by the way, I've been involved into similar projects 10 years ago with Volkswagen and Daimler Chrysler and so on. So obviously German companies are working on this too. And they're even smarter in these game shows that we can watch on TV. And besides this, um, this is IBM Watson. IBM Watson uh, is also helping doctors in the future. IBM has, or is planning to invest $1 billion into this technology to generate $100 billion. So we're talking about cognitive computing here. And cognitive computing means that there is a computer that can understand what you're saying, that is collecting huge masses of information, like all this medical publications that you know, no doctor can read because there's just too much of public, too many publications, and evaluate this and come up with conclusions uh, that would actually support doctors quite efficiently and maybe one day even replace them. So, nobody is safe anymore. This includes people in administration, this includes people who have been taking care of law students and uh, professors even, and doctors. So we're getting into a situation where there is an emerging digital sector and that challenges the industrial and service sectors. What you can see over here is that in 1850, most people have still been working in the agricultural sector. By now, there is three to five percent of people working in the sector. Then, of course, there was this digital, uh, the, the, the industrial revolution, and it uh, came with the invention of the steam engine and other kinds of inventions. And as a result, you see this yellow curve over here, so new employment was created, but we know it was a very rough transition, actually. Uh, industrialization didn't come smoothly. And eventually also the service sector came up, and that's the green curve over here, with public schools and administrations and all these kind of things. Now, the important point is that now we're seeing the birth of a fourth sector, the digital sector, and it's really competing with the previous sector. So we expect that in about 10 to 20 years, 50% of industrial jobs will be lost, uh, would be meaning less than 10% of jobs will be in the industrial sector. And the same will happen in the service sector. So that means we'll have about, say, 30% of jobs in the service sector, which means that if we add up agriculture plus industry plus service, it would be less than 50% of jobs. In other words, you know, 50% of jobs would have to be created in the digital sector. And the question is how to do this. And nobody seems to have an answer because computers are so terribly efficient. And in fact, we are already seeing a massive loss of jobs in many countries. Like in Spain, for example, in Greece, youth unemployment is skyrocketing more than 50% are unemployed over there already. So this is already ongoing. Moreover, this is killing industries too. And companies like Kodak have disappeared and will be disappearing. Kodak actually owns most of the digital camera patents, but it was unable trans to transform itself quickly enough into a modern digital company. And if you open up the recent Spiegel, it says that it's expected that about 40% of today's top 500 companies will be gone in 10 years, or just insignificant. So, we can say intelligent machines will be our tools and help us 
to do our work, then they will be our partners, and then our coaches, and eventually, perhaps, our bosses. They may run for the legal system. The question is now, how many decades will it take? But most likely, this is going to happen. And so, soon we may need upgrades to be competitive. Will we soon have brain implants? I'm not joking here, because um, there are many people who do research about these kinds of things. So I'd like to know who of you would go for an upgrade? Okay, <laughs> many more people, impressive. Okay. It's being tested already. So not just with mice and rats, actually, Neil Harbison is a cyborg, a real human being who is technologically enhanced. And so these things are going on already. Now, much of this is pretty scary, to me at least, and so the question is, does it have to go like this? Or is there an alternative approach? And in fact, there is, and I call it the self-organization approach, an approach that's like magic. And you're well familiar with it, because we see this phenomenon in many places around us, like swarm intelligence. You know, we've seen these flocks of birds, and it's really like magic how they coordinate. Same thing for school to fish, for ants, for bees, and so on. And in fact, 300 years ago, this book was written, The Fable of the Bees. And so the idea was, couldn't our society work like a beehive? Now the interesting thing about the beehive is there is no bee that really gives commands in a top-down way. Yes, there is a queen bee, but it just lays eggs. It's not controlling what all the other bees are doing. And so, couldn't our society and our economy work like this? And in fact, Adam Smith, you know, with the concept of the invisible hand, was suggesting just this. Unfortunately, it's not always working out well. So, the invisible hand doesn't always work. As pollution shows, climate change, overfishing, and other tragedies of the commons. But now, 300 years after its invention, we can finally make the invisible hand work with modern technology. And actually, this is the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things means that you know, machines and gadgets, smartphones, computers, and everything, in particular, a lot of sensors that measure the environment would be connected to the Internet. In fact, we already have more things connected to the Internet than people. And in about 10 years time, there will be 150 billion things connected to the Internet. It's a 50 15 trillion dollar market. And it helps us, for example, to overcome congestion by real-time feedback. So first of all, I'm showing you here a simulation of this annoying congestion, the stop and go traffic that we're suffering from almost every day. And this is to illustrate you that we have models that allow us to understand this phenomenon. Of course, I'd like to show you what's the reason for this annoying stop and go traffic. And for this, we're elevating ourselves, we're beaming ourselves out of this car, and it will reveal that there are a couple of cars that are trying to squeeze themselves onto the freeway that produce small disruptions, and these disruptions are amplified. And that creates cascade effects and finally the stop and go traffic. Now, assume the cars are equipped with radar sensors, and these radar sensors measure this distance and relative velocity 
and this data is used to drive the cars automatically. And we're going to change the interactions between the cars slightly in a way that's not just improving the comfort and safety, but also the collective behavior. It's stabilizing the traffic flow. It's increasing the capacity based on real-time feedback that's enabled by real-time measurement with these sensors that are the basis of the Internet of Things. Now, moreover, this information allows us to make scientific progress and complexity science allows us to understand and use the hidden forces behind this magic self organization And the main point is to feed back this information in a particular way so that the right things happen. And this self organization is going on like magic. And so if we understand this, we can use these forces to our own advantage, as in the Asian martial arts. So in other words, we can learn to use these systems for us, to let them work for us, as we've learned to turn explosions into an orderly directed motion with a motor. In a similar way, if we understand the hidden forces behind our society and our economy, we'll be able to use these forces. And so what are the mechanisms that we can use for us? Here are just a few examples. Reputation systems, for example. We now find them almost everywhere on the web. And of course, this is helping us to find suitable cooperation partners and to increase quality. In fact, it's good for suppliers and for buyers. Buyers can trust to get a better service if the reputation of the supplier is high, but the supplier can take a higher price. So it's good for both sides. There is another interesting mechanism, and who contributes more gains more. So the problem in many systems, when you have to generate a collective good, is that cooperation is unstable, as the free traffic flow was unstable and created stop-and-go traffic. So the question is how to stabilize cooperation. And in fact, it turns out if the more cooperative individuals or companies engage with the more cooperative individuals and companies, they're matched with each other, then cooperation suddenly pays off. And not only this, actually, it creates incentives for others to become more cooperative too. So this drives the system towards more cooperation. We also need to learn, in a complex world, how to bring the best ideas of many minds together much better than we've been able to do this in the past. And we can learn some interesting stuff here from the Netflix challenge. Yeah? You know, Netflix offers video on demand, and of course they want you to be happy with the videos that you watch. So you're asked to rate the videos, and everyone is doing this, and they're trying to guess what is the movie that we'd like to see. And it turns out that even though they have big data, it's difficult to predict your taste. And so they say, okay, it's worth a million dollars if you can improve our algorithm just by 10%. And there were hundreds of teams signing up for this competition, for this million. Uh, there were thousands of solutions offered, and within two years' time, nobody managed to get this 10% improvement. But then, eventually, the best team decided uh, to join together with the second best and the third best, and they were just averaging over their solutions. Now, you would think if you average the best solution and solutions that are not as good, that would create a solution that's not better. But the opposite was the case. In fact, they created the best solution and they won the competition. So diversity wins and not the best. Now, what kind of information technology could we build to support all of us, every single individual? 
Because at the moment, big data is involved, guarded, so we, we don't usually get access to it, uh, with a few exceptions, of course. And so the idea is that we would jointly build what I call a planetary nervous system as a citizen web. And in fact, it's not as difficult as you might think, because all it takes is you and your smartphone, because we can connect these smartphones to build a global measurement system. Since each smartphone contains a lot of sensors, you know, like accelerometers and uh, proximeter sensors and uh, magnetometers and uh, light sensors and noise sensors and all this, so we can open up these sensors for you to make measurements like these acceleration measurements. And we can use that, for example, to warn our friends when there is an earthquake. Of course, if just one smartphone shakes, that probably means that I'm doing a mountain bike ride. But if all our smartphones shake at the same time, that would mean that must be an earthquake. And then basically, if you want this to happen, then the people in your contact list would be warned and they would have some extra seconds to get into a safe place. <laughs> but if we want to do this, we need to build a system that we can trust, an information system that is controlled by you. And that means what we are doing is we are allowing you to decide which sensors to open and whether you use the data just for yourself or whether you want to share this data and also to control whom to share this data with and for what purpose. So informational self-determination is at the center. So why don't we do this together and create a participatory information system, an open data source but real time, a real time streaming Wikipedia, you could say. And the success principle would be give and take. That means you could take data for your own use, but of course that would only work if you give something back. And so uh, we would hope that you would share some of your data too. The same thing with the source codes that would be used to do the measurements with the sensors, because you can do all sorts of measurements. And you might have your own ideas. So we allow you to come up with your own measurement protocols. You might just modify some other codes. And so together we can grow a powerful information and innovation ecosystem together. Because, you know, we take something, we modify it, we give something back, somebody else takes it, gives it back. So that's creating exponential innovation rather than linear innovation. And with a micropayment system on top, everyone could establish new businesses. So this is how this ecosystem would flourish and collaborate with others. And in order to allow this to be successful, we're not creating a walled garden, but we're creating a platform that gives you many creative possibilities. You know? So you could come up with your own ideas what to do with all this sensor information. And so we would create new opportunities for everyone, because if set up well, enabling users, customers, citizens will lead to better services, better products, better businesses, better neighborhoods, smarter cities, smarter societies. So what are we waiting for? Get ready, support the nervousness community, because this is already on its way, and together we can make the magic happen. <coughs>
the future. Thank you very much.